Right, in this lecture, we're going to continue talking about the overall structure and function of the cell membrane. In the last lecture, we learned that the phospholipids in the cell membrane are what we call amphipatic. And this explains the overall structure of the cell membrane. Basically, if we put phospholipids into water, the molecules will either form a bilayer, which is what we see on the cells or around cells in the, the bodies of animals and in plants where the tails face each other, or they may form a spherical or circular structure called a missile. In either case, what happens is that the hydrophilic or water-loving heads face the water and the hydrophobic tails are as far away from the water as possible. And this is what it looks like. So if you essentially pour phospholipids into a jar of water, you'll either get what you see on the left where they form a circular structure with no water in the middle, or a sandwich or a lipid bilayer that we see in cells where there's no water in between the two heads on either side of the heads where the tails are found there's no water. So remember that because the fluid that we find outside of cells and the cytoplasm are both water-based, the cell membrane is what we call a self-organizing structure. And what do we mean by that? Well, phospholipids move within the bilayer. They are not, they're not stationary. They can move around within the lipid bilayer. And so because of that, we regard the cell membrane or the lipid bilayer as being something known as a fluid crystal because it's neither solid nor a liquid. And this fluid crystal gives lovely strength and flexibility to the cell membrane, allowing cells to change shape, expand and contract, and also allows the membrane, in particular instances like cell division, to break and reform again, which is very, very important, and we'll get on to cell division later in our lectures. So the extent to which the membrane is fluid depends on how tightly packed these phospholipids are together. And this fluidity affects permeability or what can come in and out of the cell. And in essence, cell membrane permeability, so what is allowed in and what is allowed out, is affected by two main factors, and these factors are important to highlight, and we'll go through each of these. First of all, when there is a double bond between carbon atoms in the fatty acid tails, this causes the tail of the fatty acid to bend or kink, and fatty acids with double bonds are known as unsaturated fatty acids. So in essence, when you have a membrane with no unsaturated fatty acids or no fatty acids with kinks in their tail, the cell membrane is not very fluid and so therefore has relatively low permeability. So it's not very easy to get in and out of a cell if there are no unsaturated fatty acids. On the other hand, if you have a membrane that has got many, many unsaturated fatty acids, so many, many unsaturated fatty acids or kinked fatty acid tails, the membrane is going to be much more fluid and therefore will have a higher permeability. So it's easier for molecules to cross the lipid bilayer. So let's just have a look at what this looks like. There's what we've just said at the top, but this is essentially what happens. When we have a double bond between the carbon atoms, we get what we see here, a kink in the tail. So we have a saturated and an unsaturated fatty acid. And remember, the more unsaturated fatty acids in the cell membrane, the greater the permeability. 
and effectively reduces the fluidity and permeability of the membrane. So essentially, the more cholesterol, the lower the permeability of the membrane. This is just a reminder of what cholesterol looks like. It's got its polar head right at the top and its nonpolar hydrophobic section below that. Now, what we need to remember is that the cell membrane or the lipid bilayer is what we call highly selectively permeable. So it's very, very particular about what can come in and what can go out. Essentially, what can move across a lipid bilayer is very, very particular. And this is because the nonpolar or the hydrophobic interior of the membrane stops the movement of all water soluble substances, including large polar molecules like sugar, amino acids, and proteins, and other larger molecules like ions. On the other hand, small nonpolar molecules like oxygen and nitrogen can actually move quite quickly across the bilayer because they're nonpolar. And when you have a look at other molecules like carbon dioxide, it's polar, it's still quite small, but it can only, because of it being polar, it can only move quite slowly across the cell membrane, not like oxygen and nitrogen. <clears throat> Now, interestingly, although water is polar, it is a very, very small molecule and so can cross the lipid bilayer. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in a moment. Now, remember, because the nature of the membrane is lipid, so there are phospholipids, steroid hormones like estrogen and testosterone can pass through the membrane very, very easily. And this is important um, for issues such as hormone action when it comes to specific cells. So here is a really nice summary diagram which you should use when you are revising your notes which gives you on the left hand side a scale of permeability. So a scale of how easily or how difficult it is for molecules to move across the membrane. Right down at the bottom in the blue, it means that it's very, very difficult for those sorts of molecules to move across the membrane. Whereas right at the top in the green, where we have oxygen, those molecules can move across the membrane quite quickly. In the center, it gives you some examples of the sorts of molecules that can cross the membrane and how easily or how difficult it would be for them. And then if you have a look on the right hand side, you can see that hydrophobic molecules like oxygen, carbon dioxide and nitrogen will move across the membrane quite easily. Still possible for small uncharged polar molecules like water, glycerol and indole to move across the cell membrane. But then when we start to have a look at large uncharged polar molecules or ions like chlorine, potassium and sodium, they are prevented from crossing the membrane. But remember that some of those ions and some of those molecules are very important for cellular function. So we need to figure out how they get across. And this is something that we'll talk about in later lectures. So let's just remind ourselves about where we are so far. The cell membrane consists of two very thin sheets of phospholipid molecules, and we call them phospholipid, we call that a phospholipid bilayer. There is another lipid known as cholesterol, which is also present, and we know that it affects the permeability or the ability of molecules to cross the bilayer. And then between the phospholipid molecules, we have a variety of proteins. We haven't spoken much about this. But we must remember, and this is something that I mentioned in the previous lecture, is that understanding the overall structure of the membrane and their chemical properties will really give us good insight into how the membrane functions. And so let's take a closer look at some of these 
important structures in the cell membrane. And the first one that we want to talk about is membrane proteins. Proteins make up about half of the membrane overall weight um, and there are about but there are about 50 times more phospholipids than proteins. So proteins are very big is what that's saying. And what we have is we have proteins that can cross the whole membrane and we call those transmembrane proteins or they can sit on one side or the other of the of the membrane and they are then known as peripheral or outside or um, proteins or the edge. Peripheral means sitting on the edge. So they can either be on the outside or the inside of the cell. So transmembrane proteins need to be, like the phospholipids, amphipatic, where they have a non-polar region that sits within the bilayer and the polar region that sits on either side. And this is what proteins, transmembrane proteins, essentially look like. We have the polar charged amino acids in the green on the outside or the edges, and then we have the nonpolar amino acids that are hydrophobic on the inside. And there are some examples of some of those amino acids. And you can go away and have a look at what those three letter abbreviations mean for the particular amino acids. And this is how it would look in diagrammatic form in the cell membrane, where we have the hydrophobic center being sandwiched between the two heads of the phospholipids, and then we have the hydrophilic ends or polar ends sticking out on either side. And these transmembrane proteins are very, very important for the overall permeability of the cell membrane. As I've just said, these proteins are very important in moving substances across the membrane. Think for a moment which substances those would be. Would they be water? Probably not. Would they be glucose? Possibly. Or no. Think about it. On the other hand, peripheral proteins tend to be involved in the communications between cells. So how cells recognize each other or in other words, talk to each other. And both of these proteins can function as enzymes. What is the function of an enzyme? If you can't remember, go back to your notes in the first couple of weeks of the term and you should be able to figure out what an enzyme's function is. So, this is what a classic diagrammatic version of a cell membrane would look like. We have the phospholipids in blue, their tails all facing each other, and then we have both peripheral and transmembrane proteins. Remembering that the transmembrane proteins are also amphipatic. Are peripheral membrane proteins amphipatic? Figure out the answer and write it into your notes. So now, taking things for, forward, we have the phospholipids and the proteins on the outside of the membrane. And these can be modified by adding a carbohydrate chain. So we turn them into what we call glycolipids or glycoproteins. And these glycolipids and glycoproteins play a very important role in cell identification and cell-to-cell -cell communication. because different cells can be characterized by different carbohydrate coats. Here is an example of what a glycoprotein can look like. We have the transmembrane protein, which then has these carbohydrate chains in the green attached to them. And those are very important in identifying what kind of cell we are dealing with. So, don't forget, here's the cell membrane structure once again, a diagrammatic structure of the cell membrane with the transmembrane proteins, the lipid bilayer, and then 
the peripheral proteins also shown. So what then about movement across the cell membrane? Substances that can move freely across the cell membrane, remember that summary diagram earlier in the lecture, will do so down the concentration gradient. So this movement is known as either diffusion or osmosis. Osmosis refers to water only, and we will deal with that a little later. So, here is a simple example of diffusion. So, sub so substances that can move easily down the concentration gradient. A membrane separates two solutions of different molecules and ions, and all of these molecules can move across the membrane. At the start, these solutes or dissolved molecules and ions are at different concentrations on either side of the membrane. Over a period of time, these solutes will move across the membrane, down their respective concentration gradients, so that the concentrations ultimately end up being the same on either side of the cell membrane. And this whole process is known as diffusion. So if you can remember and understand this process, you will know what diffusion is. The blue will tend to move to the right, and the white will tend to move, which is what they do. But they'll move to and fro so that they can balance off or become in a state of equilibrium. So the, the molecules, the solutes will continue to move back and forth until they are at equal concentrations on either side of the membrane. Now, the movement of water across the cell membrane is a special form of diffusion, and it is known as osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a membrane that is permeable to water, but not one or more of the substances that are dissolved in the water. So the water can move across, but the substances cannot. So take two solutions of different concentration of a solute that can't move across the membrane, okay? The water will move by osmosis from the dilute side to the concentrated side until the concentrations are the same. So here's some important terms or some important words which you need to know. If two solutions have different concentrations of solutes, the higher concentration is known as hypertonic and the lower concentration is known as hypotonic. Hyper means very high, hypo means very low. And if two solutions have the same concentration of solutes, they are said to be isotonic, the same. Iso means the same. So in essence, water moves from hypotonic to hypertonic solutions by osmosis. And this is what it will look like. If you have two solutions on either side of a lipid bilayer, and you have a higher concentration of solutes on the one side compared to the other, but those solutes can't move across the membrane, what is going to move across? Well, water is going to move across to try and balance out the concentration. So we start to see water decreasing from the left and moving to the right, where the concentration is highest. Here are some more examples of what tends to happen when you have a lipid bilayer and different types of solutions on either side. If you start with on the top left with a hypertonic solution outside the cell, what will you find? You'll find that water will tend to move out of the cell and ultimately it will shrink. If in the case of the center you have a hypotonic solution, water will tend to move into the cell. And if this doesn't get arrested, the cell membrane could burst.
Whereas if you have an isotonic solution, so the solution is the same on the inside as it is on the outside, we don't see a change at all. Now, what we want to have a look at next is we want to have a look at the movement of substances across the membrane when we look at bulk passage. So moving in and out of the cells, big molecules or big components. And these are through the processes of endo towards the inside and exocytosis towards the outside. So diffusion deals with the movement of small molecules, but much larger molecules need to be moved across the cell by what we call endocytosis. Now, endocytosis can be summarized using this diagram, where we have the membrane, which starts to invaginate or form a pocket at the top around these macromolecules. It then pinches closed around them, number two, and starts to close around the material, forming a vesicle. And that vesicle is then transferred to the inside of the cell. This is a very useful diagram which you should remember when you are conducting your revision. So take this and use this when you are revising, especially the labels one to four. Now the cytoskeleton extends folds of the membrane to surround the particles in the process of endocytosis. And the particle is then brought into the cell in a membrane-bound vesicle. It has to be membrane-bound because the inside of the cell is still aqueous. There are three types of endocytosis. Phagocytosis, if there is a very large particle like a bacteria. Pinocytosis, if the material is liquid. This is also known as cell drinking. And then what we call receptor-mediated endocytosis. And we'll talk a little bit more about this now. First of all, though, we have phagocytosis. And what happens here is that the large molecule attaches to the cell membrane. The cell membrane surrounds that molecule, invaginates around it, and then it ultimately brings it into the cell as a vesicle. In receptor-mediated endocytosis, the process is very much the same. But what we have is we have special proteins or ligands that attach to receptors. There, if you have a look at number one where there's binding. And these receptors obtain the, the ligands, the proteins, and they then line these particular pits, which are known as clathrin-coated pits, and because of that, the cell then starts to invaginate, cell membrane that is, again forming a vesicle and bringing that into the cell. It's a little bit more complicated in that the vesicle then uncoats and starts to fuse with what we call endosomes. And this is a, prote a process whereby cells are able to obtain particular proteins by what is in essence endocytosis. Again, a very good, important diagram for revision purposes. Now, the process of endocytosis can be reversed and material can be moved out of the cell, and this is known as a process called exocytosis. 